This is the Chris DeGall Show podcast. Okay, guys, let's just rip. And Chris DeGall. Chris DeGall. Chris, thanks for being with me tonight. Chris uh, DeGall. I'm joined now by Chris DeGall. Now, he puts the broad in broadband. It's Chris DeGall. The Chris DeGall Podcast is presented by USMedicalPlan.com. Save big money monthly and get better health coverage at USMedicalPlan.com. Hey there, it's Friday. It's the 27th day of October. Thanks a lot for downloading the Chris Stigall Show podcast. I would just recommend this is a listener content warning. This show is not for the weak of heart. This show is not for the easily offended. Uh, This show is not for the conventional in thought. This show contains some conversations today that um, have been received warmly by many and have been received uh, pretty negatively by some. Uh, all in this audience. So uh, I'll leave it to you to respond. I hope you'll give a five-star review, maybe a written review for the conversation, just for the quality of conversation. Dr. Tabia Lee wrote uh, an editorial that I said was maybe one of the most important things written in recent memory. Talked about it and put it up on social media. It was back on the 18th of this month in the New York Post. I was a DEI director. DEI drives campus anti-Semitism. This conversation you need to hear if you have kids in public school, if you're sending kids to college, or if in your corporate outfit you have a DEI director, or anytime anybody brings up DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, what is it? What does it mean? This conversation is going to open your eyes wide and clearly define what it is and what's going on. Dr. Lee also happens to be a black woman, and also Cheryl Chumley, and our friend Kevin Sorbo, who has a brand new film out. He and his uh, wife, Sam Sorbo, who I'm a big fan of. It's, um, this is a great, great show, if I do say so myself, and a perfect way to wrap up the week. And I do want to address briefly, just briefly, off the top, I want to abri- uh, address Mike Johnson, the new Speaker of the House, uh, my enthusiasm for him. Some of you are already very skeptical of him, and I understand why, um, but I want to address that because I'm getting notes from, and tweets from people that, that think I am uh, naive or something. Uh, about Mike Johnson, and so I want to explain myself a little further coming up. All right, John Ruhlman wants to talk to you about saving health insurance money and dollars on your premium. Are you buying your own health insurance? You know, it's the time of year where I know my employer is saying, hey, we got to re-up for benefits for next year. Do you know if you could find cheaper rates through him versus your work? You won't know until you call him, and it just takes a couple of minutes. You say, hey, look, uh, here's what I pay a month out of my check for my family covers me, my spouse, my kids. Here's what I pay. John may say, hey, that's a big group plan. That's the best rate for you. Don't change a thing. Or John may say, you know what? Save the money. Um, Don't get health insurance through work and buy a plan through me. It'll cover everything you currently have covered, probably more, probably better, and I can save you 30 to 60%. That may be his answer. Uh, It could be one or the other. Uh, If you're a retiree and you haven't called John about supplemental health insurance with Medicare, you you definitely should, because if you can save that kind of money in retirement, I mean, that's a no-brainer. And young people who have no health insurance at all, you've got to call John and find out how cheap you are to insure. It costs you almost, you know, nothing, like couch cushion money a month, quite frankly. Okay, maybe not that. Console in your car money. It costs nothing, really, for a young younger person to insure himself or herself. And if you need it, heaven forbid, if you're in an accident or something and you can't work, there are insurance policies that pay you. And small business folks, if you provide your own health insurance benefits for uh, employees, please call John and see if he can help your bottom line. Uh, he's a great guy. My conversation with him at chrisstigall.com. Check it out. Or usmedicalplan.com for more. usmedicalplan.com or call 877-410-4321. I'm starting to get these people because because I said it is refreshing to see a devout Christian, an unapologetic Christian, take a leadership role. It is refreshing to see that after three weeks of fighting, is there any deba- can can it be debated, Fast Eddie, that Mike Johnson is more conservative than Kevin McCarthy? Can it be debated? No, absolutely not. It cannot. It's it's not debatable. Now, apparently yesterday, at some point while he's walking through some sort of press scrum, he was asked about Ukraine funding. And walking in a hurry with a bunch of press surrounding him, he's just been made Speaker of the House. They said, what about Ukraine? You got to fund Ukraine? 
And he said something like, of course, but with conditions. This has some of your heads on fire. Well, there he goes. I'm a traitor. You see, there he did. did. Now he's at that. No different than anybody else. Look, I understand your pessimism. I understand your mistrust of the GOP. I did not. I didn't yesterday, and I'm not today promising you, guaranteeing you, assuring you that Mike Johnson's not going to disappoint you and me. Did I? Did I say that, Fast Eddie? Oh, no, of course not. I yeah. did not. I, I did not predict that Mike Johnson was going to be the next Ronald Reagan. I didn't predict anything about Mike Johnson, did I? No, what do we have, a four-seat majority or something like that in one branch of the government? Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I want to be very clear on this point. Did I say anything about tomorrow and going forward as it relates to Mike Johnson yesterday? No, you did not. No, I didn't, and I'm not now. What I said and what I've been saying is we held out, we hung tough, we fought, and we got a more conservative speaker than Kevin McCarthy by a lot, I would say. And I judge his words, his actions, his votes to date. To date. And there is nothing in his resume to date that gives me anything to pause about. Nothing. I cheer Mike Johnson to date. What he ends up doing as Speaker of the House remains to be seen, and as always, I'll keep my powder dry and I'll reserve judgment. And I have every right, as you do too, to say, you know what? Mike Johnson was a stud and somehow lost his way as Speaker in the next months to come if, in fact, he becomes nothing more than a Kevin McCarthy with a Bible. I mean, if that's, if that's what he is, then I'm not interested. But I admire his commitment to his faith. I admire his testimony. That makes me very happy. He's a believer. And so I, that's a positive. There's, there's nothing wrong with Mike Johnson to date, in my view. I am very pleased for once. And let me, you know, I was thinking about this, and I didn't quite get it said yesterday, so let me say it this time. What happened in this speaker fight over three weeks was a handful of moderates, 25 moderates or so, hung tough and hung together trying to make the case that somebody like Jim Jordan shouldn't be allowed to be Speaker of the House. And they were going to stand on, they were not going to let a guy like Matt Gates win the day. Okay, you oust our guy, well, we're not going to let you have your guy. And even The Hill reported What ended up happening after three weeks was, the Hill said it, Ken Buck, one of the leading uh, Republican moderates, he said it. He confessed in the Hill, we got tired. We got tired. We needed to move on. We needed a speaker. We acquiesced. We gave him Mike Johnson. And you know what that tells me? You can beat moderates. Conservatism can win. If conservatism is committed to and you hang tough with it, it can win. The problem is we always fold and acquiesce and pack our tent and go home and say, well, the media is getting loud and the voters are getting upset, so we'd better not push too hard. And this time, conservatives kept pushing and insisting. And who backed down? Who backed down? This time, for the first time in a long time, who backed down? The moderates in the Republican caucus, backed down. That's a tremendous, and again, I'm celebrating the victory today. I'm not forecasting the next several months. I'm not forecasting what kind of speaker Mike Johnson's going to be. I'm celebrating what is right now. All I can deal with is what is right now. And what happened right now is the Republican Party for once The conservative wing of the Republican Party stood up, grew a set, and said, we're not backing off this. And if it takes weeks, it'll take weeks. But they got there, and the moderates shut up, and they tucked their tail, and they acquiesced. And isn't that refreshing? Can't we celebrate that win? Do we immediately have to go into the, yeah, but did you hear what he said about Ukraine? And now he's going to let us down again. Maybe, but let's wait till the legislation's written. 
Let's wait till the votes are cast. I, I can't pred- – why are we – I understand. Listen, I, I don't misunderstand me as being angry or frustrated with you for being pessimistic because I understand why you are. But this was a win this week. There is no reason to hang your head and go, well, all's lost already. Let's, let's just – for a minute, let's just kind of bask in the win and see where we go next. Some of you are already ready to throw Mike Johnson overboard because he made some quip in a press scrum while walking uh, about Ukraine. I don't know what they end up doing. I mean, I, I I don't know. And he says conditions have to apply. Well, um... There are no conditions right now on funding Ukraine. None, none at all. There have been no parameters set. It should, the husk keeps asking for money, and Republicans keep rubber stamping the money. So is, is it a start to say we're not giving any more money unless conditions are met? That's a start. Yes, in a perfect world, would I love the Republican Party to just seize all spending and not move off that position? I would. And maybe they still will. I don't know. I don't know. Can't predict. Not going to bother. It's no use because we don't know what we don't know. And we can only deal with what is when it's here in front of our faces. So I'm going to wait and see on Mike Johnson about tomorrow. But today, today I celebrate the win for conservatism because he is a conservative. No one can argue that he's a conservative. And no one can argue that he's not a markedly better conservative leader than Kevin McCarthy. That's today. We'll deal with tomorrow tomorrow. Okay, it's time to start thinking about your financial future. Never too early. Here we are in early 2023. What are your goals? Have you visited your financial situation with a pro that knows what they're doing? Making plans for your future yet? Well, if you haven't, may I recommend Jason Perrett? to you. Jason is a financial advisor at Eagle Wealth Planning, and he wanted me to talk with you in this audience. He values this audience. He's a listener of this podcast, and he said, I want to reach your audience. I want to help them plan their financial future, providing financial services to people who want to truly achieve financial independence, and he doesn't care where you are. If you are a uh, accomplished entrepreneur, if you're a, a professional, a retiree, even if you're a young person and you just want to start the lifelong goal of financial independence, and you don't quite know where to get started, Jason can do that for you. He's a fiduciary. He's dedicated to providing clients with complete wealth management and investment services, along with highly personalized professional assistance. Jason will regularly revisit your plan, and that's one of the key things about this business is regularly checking in and assessing where things are, making sure you're on track, assessing assessing your risk tolerance, strategies to provide you the high level of service that you would expect from someone in this position. And you can call him anytime you'd like, 816-394-8117. He's extremely available and accessible at all times, 816-394-8117. That's Jason Perrett, financial advisor at Eagle Wealth Planning, 1717 Paddock Drive in Kearney, Missouri. It doesn't matter where you live in the country. If you're listening to my voice and you need some help with financial planning, you want somebody that you know uh, you're going to be on board with, you know, because you listen to this show, Jason's your man, all right? So it's jason at eaglewealthplanning.com. His website is linked on mine at chrisstigall.com if you'd like to go there and link up. Securities and advisory services offered through Satera Advisors, LLC, member FINRA, SIPC, a broker-dealer, and a registered investment advisor. Satera is under separate ownership from any other named Entity. There have been some listeners to this podcast for a while that uh, are, are great supporters and uh, friends, and now they've decided to jump in and become sponsors. I'm proud to have them aboard. Uh, they're guys that operate a website called gulagamerica.com. They try to have a little fun and a little irreverence with the very real state of affairs we find ourselves in these days. In fact, regularly when I post something on social media, you'll see them come in and they'll say something like, that's Gulag America. Well, that's a brand name. That's actually what they've been trying to frame so much of what we're living through, what they call Gulag America. They've been great supporters of the Harumph Society as well, founders as a matter of fact. I'm so pleased and proud to have them as sponsors. Gulagamerica.com. Go to their website, your online home for what they call apparel with attitude. I think you're going to dig it. 
If you're unhappy with the direction the country is headed, I think that speaks for itself for most of this audience. If you're dismayed that three quarters of Democrats and half of Republicans want the government to restrict hate speech, potentially meaning shows like this one, podcasts like this one, um, that's Gulag America. Go to gulagamerica.com. They're the shop for you. They have everything from American classics like Gadsden flag shirts that say don't tread on me to original designs ripped from the headlines, like the recent edition that reads, Mask me once, shame on you. Mask me twice, shame on me. Pretty good. That and so many more. Great shirts, great apparel. Gulagamerica.com. Great supporters of this show. Great American patriots and friends and founding members of the Harumph Society. Honored to have them aboard. Gulagamerica.com. As they say, Gulag America, it's not our wish. It's our warning. GulagAmerica.com. Welcome aboard, fellas. Hey, it's a pleasure to welcome back to the show the one and only Kevin Sorbo. Mr. Sorbo, it's a pleasure. Welcome back. Good to be back. Good to see you guys. Congratulations on the brand new film, Miracle in East Texas. Yep. Uh, this, this look, I just watched the trailer before we started talking. This looks fantastic. I can't wait to see it. It's a very fun movie. It's a true story uh, set in 1930, right in the middle of the uh, America's Depression at that time. And um, these two con guys, played by myself and John Ratzenberger, would go through Oklahoma and Texas, and they would uh, con widows out of their money on, f on fake oil wells. They would sell 500% of the shares, five times more than anything's worth. And then they would declare dry hell, move on to the next town. They get to Kilgore, Texas. They strike oil, but totally by accident. Of course, they get arrested. And um, it's just uh, it's a wonderful true story uh, written by John um, – I mean, sorry – by Dan Gordon. Dan Gordon's an Oscar-nominated writer. He wrote The Hurricane for Denzel Washington, White Earp, Kevin Costner. Uh, just a great writer. And this movie's won 10 film festivals, everything from best family movie to best comedy, uh, best faith movie, best judges' favorite, audience favorite. They can't really pigeonhole it, but one thing they can all say is that it's a PG-rated movie, and kids uh, and families of all ages can see it. And it's just a wonderful, non-woke non you know divisive non-hating it's just a fun movie with a lot of good humor involved in the well but it's a movie that's got redemption in there and laughter things and hope things that are missing in america right now for sure and john ratzenberger I, i've never interviewed him myself but I, I think these are projects he gravitates toward as well if i understand him personally a little bit oh, yeah. the projects he wants to associate with no question he and i did a movie together back in 2010 called What If. Now I've done over 80 movies. What If is still in my top three favorite movies and best movies I've ever been part of. And uh, it's the same writers did a movie I did called God's Not Dead. God's Not Dead was a massive hit, but uh, the reality is What If's a better movie. But we got to fight in the independent world just to get people to see the movie. We need word of mouth. We don't have a $100 million advertising budget like Hollywood does for you know, avatars and Thors and Spider-Mans and stuff, you know, where they can put commercials in every football game and every sitcom. We got to fight for, uh, you know, people's voices to get these movies out there. So we got two days, October 29th and 30th, this weekend coming up. Go to sorbostudios.com, sorbostudios.com. Sign up right now. You get, uh, put your zip code in, shows you what theaters are near you, and hopefully you'll uh, help fill up these theaters. Tell tell everybody you know to go see this movie. It's a great family movie. If if for some reason after these two dates uh, pass by, will there be opportunity to see it in addition to the theaters? If it does well, if it does well in theaters, we'll get more days. And that just okay, makes our, you know, increases our value to put it on uh, the streaming services. So um, the more that we get uh, days in theaters, the better chance we got to get a good streaming service to make sure everybody can still see it. You know what? I, and again, because it's a true story, it's not totally analogous, but it kind of seeing some of the clips and seeing you in the pulpit um it, it kind of reminded me a bit of uh th that hanks movie a few years ago called lady killers was that a coen brothers film oh, kind yeah. of a, I, remember I, that? Remember. I, I think it might be a coen brothers movie yeah and it would but again same deal they were preying upon a widow uh to to, to steal a bunch of money but n neither here nor there it's a it's a great plot but i see you kind of evangelizing a little bit was that part of the is that Part of the scam, well, you know, part of part of their their act. I mean, my guy was the main flim flam guy. John Ratzenberger's character, Doc Everett, was a real oil man, and he just had a string of bad luck where he ran out of money at certain oil sites, and somebody else came in and took over and drilled another thousand feet down and struck oil. Um, his name was D H Everett, and they used to say D H stood for dry hole. So. <laughs> um, it was uh, it, it, my character would woo widows with Bible verses and uh, 
Shakespeare soliloquies. So uh, he was a bit of a charmer with the ladies. And uh, like I said, it's a true story. So he goes to a, a church to try to raise more money and to woo over this black Baptist crowd there in uh, East Texas. And uh, it's just, it's just, it was fun. It's a wonderful script. It was just a fun script. Dan Gordon is a brilliant writer. Oh, it looks, it's, it, to see you do the big flamboyant preacher bit in the pulpit was very funny. That must've been fun to play. It was fun. It was yeah. a good scene. We had a great location. I mean, I showed this movie to about 400 oil guys in Oklahoma City, another 400 in Texas. And I remember one of the guys from Texas after screening, we did a Q&A and he said, I know exactly who you shot that. And I said, no, you don't. He goes, what? <laughs> I said, we shot it in Canada. He goes, what? <laughs> so um, I said, it's called show business, not show show. You get a bigger <laughs> tax credit. You go to Canada, you get 30% tax credit. You get 25% more on your dollar because U.S. dollar is stronger. And we shot the same ranch, the 3,000 acre ranch outside of Calgary that Clint Eastwood used in Unforgiven. If it's good enough for Clint Eastwood, it's good enough for Kevin Sorbo. That's, there you go. Uh, your wife, Sam Sorbo, is also in this film. Yep. I don't know how often you work with her uh, or have in the past, but that's always fun, I'm sure. Assuming you guys like working together, not every spouse likes working with their spouse. I get it. We, uh, no, we have a good fight, but uh, <laughs> we, um, you know, we met on the set of Hercules. I lived in the Hercules seven years filming that series, which uh, by season three, the sin of pride, but I got to say it became the most watched TV show in the world in 176 countries. And uh, we met at the end of season four on that series. And we've done, my gosh, I think we've been in about six or seven movies together. We had one most recently that was in theaters uh, January and February this year called Left Behind, Rise of the Antichrist, based on the Left Behind books from Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye. You, in fact, in talking with her not too terribly long ago about her own podcast and this film coming up, she mentioned that you as a family all had traveled to Israel as, and taken a, a group of folks with you. Uh, I don't know if that actually happened or not. Did it? And that was obviously prior to this massive conflict we see now. Um, what what did you take from that trip? I've never taken it well, myself. We've been, there, we've been there five. I've been there five times now. Sam's been there four times. Um, we take a group of eighty people every year. Obviously, COVID shut it down for a couple of years, um, but uh, the, I take the family with us. Sam and I host it. Uh, we were just there in May of this year. Um, that pretty scary because they, you know, I read they've been planning this attack for up to two years now, and uh, we. Um, I've shot two documentaries there. I have one coming out uh, later next year that I shot in Israel three weeks on my own. Sam came along just with me on that trip and the production company out of Houston, Texas. And, uh, you know, it's an amazing it's an amazing trip. It's incredibly sad what's going on there right now, obviously. Uh, you know, they're surrounded by all these countries that want to wipe Israel off the face of the map. And uh, every time I've been there, I've never felt threatened. I've never felt in danger, but I would feel that way now, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's too bad because we already had about 30 people signed up for next year's trip next May. But that doesn't look like it's going to happen now, which, which is unfortunate. Sam has been a passionate advocate for this. But um, both of you, I know, as parents have valued uh, homeschooling as the option for your kids. C can you sp speak to that? I know you've said that's kind of Sam's lane. But but why you as a dad uh, value that your children have been homeschooled? Well, I see. How, look, our, our, our homeschooling, I mean, our public schools are horrible. I mean, we're one of the worst in the world. I think we rank around 30th in the world in public education. Uh, you know, anything run by the government doesn't work very well anyway. I mean, I'm reminded of Ronald Reagan's favorite quote when he said, these are the words to fear. Hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And uh, we know that those are, those are words to live by. And um, everything the government does run, they just destroy it. And public schools are crazy. They just passed a law, was in Oregon or something, that uh, they can graduate kids now, 18-year-olds, even if they can't read or write. I'm going, what? I mean, it's incredible. So we we joke, I had friends in Minnesota where I grew up that were homeschooling back in the 80s, and that was like a rare thing. But um, we jumped on board right away. I think the, my oldest now is 22. After second grade in public schools, him, we just moved all three kids in the, in the homeschooling. And I think one of the blessings of COVID is that uh, 2 million more families are now homeschooling. They, they yes. kind of woke up and looked at public schools and saying, you know, look what they're doing. Look what the school boards are doing. Look at the books they're putting kids in. Look at the books they're getting read of. And look at the subject matter they're dealing with. I never deal with that. When I, when I was in public schools, 
If you're a math teacher, you taught math. If you're an economics teacher, you talk economics. History, you taught history. They're not doing that anymore. They're pushing this weird agenda on these kids. That's just strange. It's a total brainwashing thing. And it's just, it's got to end. When Bill Maher comes out last week and says, we need to tell parents not to send their kids to universities, <laughs> you, you know that people are waking up on the left to realize how horrible it is out there for kids. So it is, uh, if people go to sorbostudios.com, not only from Miracle East Texas, You'll get more of my stuff on that website and also a lot of Sam's stuff on that website as well. Yeah, she's she's been a great friend of the show. Um, and in terms of your community, that being kind of uh, the entertainment community, the Hollywood community, is is education a point of discussion? I mean, a lot of people who are of means, I know, hire, what, private tutors for their kids and often travel with their kids. Sure. Um, it, it's actually, as a concept, homeschooling is actually not that foreign to people in well, entertainment with means, is it? We always did homeschooling before before you know public schools started happening. I mean, Abe Lincoln was a public school, a private a homeschooled kid. You know, yeah. uh, when the government took over, that's when it got worse. I think in the '60s is when it really started to go downhill. Uh, they took the Bible out of the classroom, and they then they um, from the Welfare Reform Act to Vietnam War to the hippie thing to the rock and roll. And I like rock and roll. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I think all these things combined. I think sort of led to uh, in Hollywood. I mean, Andrew Breitbart said it best, you know, rest in peace, great friend of ours, uh, said politics runs downstream from culture. Who runs the culture? Well, Hollywood does, and so does mainstream media. So this constant brainwashing of kids over and over and over again. Um, you know, we look at murder, which I call, which I replace from the word abortion as a common thing to do. These same people on the left want to save a sea turtle leg or save a tree. They'll chain themselves to trees. But to kill a baby is no big deal to them. And so um, it's it's really amazing how callous and how uh, really just sort of stigmatized the world has become and just being so apathetic to the, the human life. Is uh, the entertainment industry becoming warmer to you and people like you who share your values, or is it still a tremendous host hostility? I, I would think they'd be waking up culturally to seeing the success you know, of films like yours or no you would you would hope so i mean in the last 10 12 years there have been a lot of great family movies out there that uh, have done quite well hollywood has this agenda it's weird i did a movie called let there be light that i directed that sam wrote along with dan gordon who wrote miracle east texas and that movie opened number two per screen average against thor ragnarok so a 300 million dollar movie up against a three million dollar movie i get a call from netflix saying we want to talk to you the Monday after opening weekend, we want to open an inspirational division with you. So I had like four meetings with them over three months and ultimately nothing happened. And my last meeting with them, I said, it's amazing to me that this this birth of ideology that you have, this hatred and anger towards anybody who's conservative or, or anybody who's a Christian, um, you guys will just do anything to attack that. And you don't want to you guys are the ones who called me. I didn't call them. And ultimately, they never did this inspirational division of Netflix, which is just weird to me. And I could tell in that office there was half those people agreed with what I was saying, but they're too afraid to speak up. The left is so powerful with its message, so filled with its anger and hate in the media that for decades have been beating into kids through public schools and universities. People are afraid to speak the truth anymore. Wake up. I mean, I got blacklisted from Hollywood. I'm a cancel culture victim from a dozen years ago before cancel culture became a term. I think I'm the grandfather of it now because it started with me in terms of Hollywood saying we can't work with it anymore because God forbid we have truth in, in, in our movies, in our industry. Uh, truth is like kryptonite to the people on the left. I mean, they'd rather live in their lies than live in their hate and their anger. So uh, I'm going to fight back with doing movies that Hollywood used to do. And that's what I'm going to keep on doing because I enjoy doing movies that have hope in them, that have freedom in them, that have character development, that aren't just filled with 75% visual effects. Because, look, I like a Spider-Man movie, too, but you leave the theater going, yeah, I don't really care about anybody in the movie, but it was kind of a cool roller coaster, right? I mean, it's all visual effects. I like doing movies that Hollywood used to do, movies that Clint Eastwood is still doing, you know, yes, movies yes. that have real stories and real character development behind them. Do you think, as I watch, you know, like Turner Classic movies, you see a Mr. Smith goes to Washington sure. or something like that. I, I don't know. Maybe you can't or wouldn't feel comfortable speaking for a Jimmy Stewart today. But do you think that was an era of Hollywood that was more in line with traditional values or they weren't thinking sure. about it? They were. Hollywood is pretty conservative. If you look at the Warner Brothers that formed Warner Studios, they were Jewish and they were full on conservatives. Hollywood was mostly conservative back in the day, just like the black population was. I mean, they were the popular. They were the they were the followers of Abe Lincoln. Abe Lincoln was the first Republican uh, Party president that got elected. So um, 
things, like I said, once again, things changed in the 60s. Martin Luther King was conservative. But when they passed the Welfare Reform Act back in 1964 in the LBJ, they told uh, women in the, in the black culture, look, if you have babies and there's no man in the house, we'll help take care of you. Well, now it's become something they just do. They'll, they'll, have, they'll have six babies from six different guys by the time they're 30 years old just to collect an extra paycheck. I mean, it's, it's a weird way to make a living. It's kind of sad in that way. But the black population prior to that Welfare Reform Act had a much lower divorce rate than the white population did. And now that's just totally switched around. Yeah. Um, the film Miracle in East Texas, the latest project, in theaters uh, October 29th and October yep. 30th. If people turn out and fill these theaters, uh, you'll get a, a longer run, which I'm excited about. I think you will. The movie, it really, the trailer, I, I know you can't judge anything by its cover, but this trailer just looks fun. It really looks like an entertaining film. I can't wait. It, it's a blast. And people go to sorbostudios.com. They can click on the link from Miracle News Texas. Look at the trailer. It has information there about what theater is near you. So uh, I hope people jump on board and support this movie. It's a fun PG-rated movie. You can take your kids to it. Kevin Sorbo, if people want anything to do with any of your projects, past uh, or otherwise, they can go to sorbostudios.com and most everything of yours is there, right? Everything's up there. Sign up. We keep you up to date. I got four of the movies in post-production. I'm about to start a Christmas movie here pretty soon in Texas. And um, I've got two documentaries coming out. I've been doing a lot of documentaries over the last seven years. And these are wow. wonderful, uh, wonderful true story documentaries. Man, a rolling rock gathers no moss. You don't stop, man. That's impressive. Uh, it's, been, it's been busy. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Sorbo, my best to your wife, Sam. Thanks a lot for your time today. It really is. The jingle is true. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. I am. I'm sleeping like a baby. I can't lie about it. I mean, I have this MyPillow body pillow I use every single night. Tuck it under the blankets. Lay next to me. I know, not very romantic on Valentine's Day, but um, most of us that have been married and uh, you're sleeping nightly, after a while, you know, people sleep hot. I don't know about you. I just, I get hot. I need space. <laughs> but my pillow, what's so great about my pillow and their new my pillow 2.0 technology is it's exactly for people that sleep hot. So uh, I get this side sleeping thing where I really, I just can't sleep on my back or my stomach. I like sleeping on the side. Maybe you do too. This body pillow they make. Like it doesn't get hot, but it is so supportive and it's like three feet long. So it's just perfect to lay your head on. You can tuck it in between your knees to take a little pressure off the lower back or the knees. I love it. Plus I'm on these Giza dream sheets, which are crazy comfortable. We've got the uh, towels, which are super absorbent. We dry off with every morning. Uh, thanks to MyPillow.com. My dog Dean is on the MyPillow bed for the dog. Loves it. Uh, and that's just some of the products. I'm Right now, I'm sipping my coffee. Mike has his own line of mm, coffee. I, I got the light brew. Uh, I think next time I'm going to order the dark brew and try that. But all of these products and so many more, from the robes to the slippers, Christine loves her MyPillow slippers. you got to check it out. And if you go to MyPillow.com and order today, you, you use my promo code CHRISPODCAST, CHRISPODCAST, that allows you to save up to 66% on everything on the website. And uh, it also lets them know that you listen to the podcast, which means a lot to me. Um, they're advertising with me and the hopes to reach you. I know you're going to love the products, but when you let them know Chris Podcast, it gets you the discount and lets them know you listen. So thanks for that. It's a three-legged stool. Hopefully everybody wins. So MyPillow.com, promo code Chris, or for the best customer service, you should know everything you order, 60-day money-back guarantee, a 10-year warranty, so they're really high-quality products and made here in the United States. So 800-932-5056 to order in person, 800-932-5056 or MyPillow.com, promo code Chris. We came across a fascinating column in the New York Post uh, a while back, and if you didn't see it, um, odds are you've probably heard about it by now. The headline read, I was a DEI director... DEI Drives Campus Anti-Semitism. It was authored by a, a woman called Dr. Tabia Lee. And I, I was so intrigued by it that I, I said, well, we've got we've to find her if she's willing to come on. And thankfully, she was willing to come on and joins us now. Uh, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. I was talking with you a little bit before the conversation started, and uh, I said, gosh, you, you've probably had a lot of attention because of this editorial. Uh, I guess since I read the initial editorial, you've you've been published in a couple of other spots. Yes. Um, actually, one of them was before the, the editorial uh, with the journal of Free Black Thought. 
Um, that was a piece that I wrote um, uh, called DEI Colleagues, Your Anti-Semitism is Showing, and It's Time for an Ideological Reckoning. Uh, and then I also just recently had a letter to the editor published in uh, the uh, Wall Street Journal, which is uh, outlining, you know, just a response uh, to one of the things that they had posted um, about a campus anti-Semitism and wanting to inform people again of the critical social justice ideology roots of, of all of these things. I, I'm... Um thrilled to talk with you because I think you can give me and uh, the audience a lot of insight into this concept of DEI generally. Before we get into your story specifically, I wanted to just talk about diversity, equity, inclusion as a concept and your role as a, a director of that initiative when hired. Can you help us, given what you've written and the way you say it's been sort of uh, compromised, if not outright bastardized, uh, as a vessel for anti-Semitism, which I appreciate and understand, help me, can we go back to kind of the root of DEI? Because uh, I can tell you that a lot of people um, get very nervous these days when they hear it. How do you define it and describe it? Well, there's many ways to define and describe it, and I think that that's something that's important for people to understand, Chris. Um, in many places and sectors, education, corporate, civic life, um, we've seen DEI policies pop up. Um, but what we, what we haven't seen is a transparency about the ideologies that they're rooted in. Um, and this is something that I uh, have made central to my work. Uh, in the early 2000s, I coined this phrase, ideology in practice. Um, it really is trying to raise awareness uh, that there are different racial, gender, political, religious, and all sorts of ideologies that we embody and in practice um, in, in our teaching and in our educational policy. Um, and in this instance, what we saw uh, during the pandemic was this advancement of a specific kind of DEI work, uh, which I call uh, critical social justice work. And I hadn't encountered this myself until I had my experience that you may have uh, heard of, you know, in reading the article briefly there um, at De Anza College. It's a California community college. Um, and when I was hired on there as a faculty director for the Office of Equity, Social Justice and Multicultural Education, I came to discover very quickly um, that my understanding of those words was quite different than the people who were going to be making the decision around my tenure review process. Mm -hmm. um, and that difference is what led them to target me and bully and intimidate me and harass me. And, and when I wouldn't resign, uh, they uh, subverted my tenure review process to uh, fire me. And that's exactly what took place after two years of a long, uh, prolonged battle uh, around that. And so how were they different? Um, Prior to that, I've been in education my whole life. I've been a teacher my, my entire life. I always tell, I joke around with people that, you know, I've been teaching as long as I've uh, been learning because I was a gifted and talented student and used as a peer tutor. Uh, but of course I got, you know, formal education and became a teacher and a teacher educator and taught in East LA public middle schools for many years and have done a ton of teacher trainings and, and so forth around, you know, topics of inclusion, diversity and so forth. Um, and my understanding of equity was always the textbook definition of equity, which is fairness. Um, and that was what I had encountered at all the institutions that I had worked at prior to that, my, you know, public school experience. Um, after I got my doctorate, I, the job search didn't go quite like I thought it would. So I did some adjunct or part-time teaching for, for quite some time. And most of the institutions where I worked were private Catholic universities. Um, and they were using also a classical uh, definition of social justice uh, and understanding of equity as well. So I had always been in places in spaces where, you know, people were meaning the same things when we talked about things. Uh, but I never assume anything. And, and I did over 60 hours of needs assessment conversations when I got to De Anza um, with faculty staff and all kinds of uh, uh, um, um, faculty staff and administrators. And I wanted to see what their on the ground definitions were. And what I discovered was uh, from multiple people, you know, we're all saying these words like equity and so forth, but we all mean different things. Uh, there was no uh, institutional definition at that time, even though this is a, a an institution that 
uh, claims to have, you know, this long history of doing social justice work and so forth. No one had ever sat down and defined it together. So that's why there's a lot of fragmentation. Interesting. Um, so yes. may I may I ask on that point then, Doctor Lee? Um, I I trust you came at this from a place of of goodwill. You say the words mean what they mean to you. Words mean things, and they have a definition. Uh, so you came to the table in good faith and goodwill. I think a lot of us politically today uh, get the sense that DEI is used as a, t- as a tool to um, kind of foster a notion of certain types of people who look a certain way ought be elevated because certain other people who look a certain way are oppressive. Um, so I, I think a lot of us get prickly now hearing DEI, assuming one group's going to have to be uh, marginalized if another is to be elevated. Is that a fair assessment of the way we look at it today versus the way you came into it? Um, so what you're describing is is more what I've named the critical social justice yes. of, uh, perspective. Um, and that's the name that I've applied to it because I think people need words to describe it when they're trying to talk about it with their, you know, educational leaders and so forth. Um, but that you're, you're exactly, you've encapsulated uh, some of the core principles of a critical social justice approach, you know, viewing people as uh, victims or oppressors of uh, this hyper focus on race and gender identities um, and, you know, uh, this, you'll hear this concept called in- intersectionality that they talk about uh, quite a bit. Um, and, you know, they try to put people on a power and privilege matrix and tell you that, you know, you were born into this particular position of, uh, you know, power uh, and privilege. And, and you can never escape that. And as a result, you know, you must do X or Y, you know, to, to remedy uh, the, the sins of your ancestors, if you will. Um, or, or to help uplift those, you know, who were put down by your ancestors. So it's this, it's this focus on um, viewing uh, everything through this lens of division mm-hmm. of, of race and, and gender and, and really an anti-American sentiment as well embedded in it. And we see this a lot in our, um, I, I encourage people to take a look in your local school and district. You'd be surprised if you just look up ethnic studies Um, There's a whole subgroup of of classes around that, Uh, American studies, Latino studies, Filipino studies, gender studies, uh, all of these, quote, whatever studies uh, are usually rooted in these critical social justice um, ideologies. And if people took a look at the syllabi, I think they would be shocked, uh, especially you hear American studies, right? You think that as, as a former civic educator, I think, oh, this is great. You know, they're going to be learning about, you know, uh, America yeah. and, um, you know, why uh, we're, we're uh, one of the, you know, models for the world in terms of, you know, our, our republic and democracy. No, that's not what they learn at all. Uh, they learn how to be anti-American. Um, they learn that uh, America is founded on white supremacy and racism and all of these other uh, concepts and constructs that as a parent or as a, even an educator, you wouldn't anticipate that when you see the titles. Uh, you have to really get in there and dig deep and, and, and start asking some questions. And I encourage people to do that because these these are the programs that have now become mainstreamed. Yeah, I, um, in part. Yeah, I, I, sorry to interrupt you, Doctor Lee, but I uh, this is one of those things that when um, I, this wasn't too terribly long ago, the school district that uh, my wife and I had our children in, um, it, it it was really in the last three or four years. Not it hasn't been five, so it's a relatively new uh, position in in our children's school district that we ultimately ended up leaving and that was a dei director and it was a well-paid position too it's a six-figure spot that was kind of created and it was new to our district um so i i again i'm kind of gently asking because i don't want to offend you i i I, you had that title but i you certainly don't come at it in the way i view it today. So should people, I guess my question is, should people be naturally suspicious now when a school district creates a DEI director? Uh, is it, Should you instantly think, oh, oh, that means trouble in your view or no? Well, what we've seen is an explosion, like you mentioned, uh, Chris, of these positions. Um, this has cropped up as a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and a lot of people, you know, have their stake in it. And the problem with it, you know, no one's saying that people shouldn't learn to, you know, um, work with each other and, and learn from diverse, you know, cultures and all the people that make our community so great. No one's no one's saying that. Um, but what is being said is that sometimes 
not sometimes, but too often, um, there is a default perspective being pushed and people aren't being transparent about it. Um, if they would just be transparent, right? When your district brought that DEI person on, um, if they said, this person's role is going to be to decenter whiteness in the district. And um, that means that we're going to elevate the voices of, you know, um, BIPOC. They, they use all these words that they've invented and, and, and inversions of, of words, too. That we that can't define, by the way, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, and, and that's going to be their role. Those are the, 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 the terms that should be making you say, oh, hey, something's off here. Yes. What are BIPOCs? What are Latinxes? You know, <laughs> what are Philippinxes and all these X ending words, you know? something's uh, amiss mm -hmm. and 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 you know and as i mentioned to some people i say you know it's garbage in garbage out we're giving our children garbage and we're telling them uh and teaching them to hate groups of people um to view themselves as victims or oppressors you know um to hate jewish people to hate zionists to hate america um in american society and that's not okay and some legislators in some places like my home state they're trying to make it a high school graduation requirement for students to take a, quote, ethnic studies class and to get fully indoctrinated by these toxic ideologies. Wow. And that's a big that's a big concern as parents. You know, some of us, we kind of stood on the sidelines and we said, like, OK, you know, that's like some weird California stuff or that's not happening here. I think now we're seeing it's happening larger and more widespread than we thought and even if you don't have kids in schools because some people said my kids are out like we're all good right we don't have to worry about it yes we do <laughs> this is who's training our, our future medical professionals um this is who's training our scientists this is who's training you know all of our students are getting indoctrinated into these ideologies uh, and we've just kind of passively let it happen without pushing back without questioning um, without asking, you know, our districts, what do you mean uh, when you say DEI policy? What philosophy is that rooted in? Are you guys talking about a classical approach, you know, where, where we're focusing on equality of opportunity? Or are you talking about a critical social justice approach where, where we're really talking about equality of outcomes mm. in every meaning of the word? Mm. Um, you know, so yes. those are the things that we need to start asking. And I hope my work and my research gives people the language because a lot of this has been has really advanced through because they're using terms that sound on its face right who doesn't want to be anti-racist for example like of course i'm not a racist yeah, equal you know? equity equal everybody wants to be right. equal treated equally sure yeah exactly exactly and and so the words sound like things that you would you know instinctively agree with but what they mean and what the philosophy that it's rooted in is something that's very dangerous it's demotivating for the very students it purports to help um, we can see that even in the test scores which are still flatlining everywhere and actually have worsened when we're, where we see these dei officers installed um, there was a, um, a piece by the Heritage Foundation recently where they outlined the presence of these DEI chief diversity officers um, for, you know, not just black students and Latino students, but white students, all students was depressed and went down when these people were hired on and brought in. Wow. And that's what they were supposed to be there to do, right? To close the achievement gap. Yeah. It hasn't worked because what they're doing is toxic and they're actually demotivating all students doctor, um, by focusing on that. May I ask you, Dr. Lee, specifically about the anti-Semitism you say you encountered? And, and by that, I don't, you're not, you're not Jewish to my understanding. Is that right? Right. And I always find it interesting when people ask that question. Um, that's a, that's a question that's only been asked of me recently. Um, um, but I've been teaching, as I mentioned, for over 30 years, and I've always done work around anti-Semitism, uh, Holocaust education, uh, sure. uh, Jewish inclusion. That's just been part of my work. So yeah, I it's only I, it's not the responsibility only of Jewish people. Of course not. Um, and to I talk about you know, Jewish inclusion. I ask it only as a framing question because I think it's a more remarkable story that it isn't as though you come in hardwired as a Jewish person to be uh, some might out from the outside suggest you're hypersensitive to something. You you came in eyes wide open as a non-Jewish person at this college, and you recognized right away that the things you were being asked to implement were overtly hostile to Jews. I And I find the whole concept of it fascinating. How do you justify anti-Semitism built in this thing that is supposed to elevate those 
who are oppressed. I, I don't even. What's the hardwiring mentally to get there? The jujitsu in someone's mind to get to a place where being anti-Semitic is fair or equitable somehow. Yeah, um, that that was something I felt like I, I fell down a black hole or a rabbit hole uh, <laughs> when I went into De Anza. No, truly, Chris, like I had never seen educators acting and speaking and behaving in this way. And then at an institutional level, um, we're talking about, you know, even the academic Senate who is supposed to be there to protect all faculty, you know, not acting. Um, so when I first started, as I mentioned to you earlier, I did these needs assessment conversations and um, that's where it was brought to my awareness that there was a problem of anti-Semitism, not just at De Anza College, but in the whole Foothill De Anza district. It's a two district, small um, community college district. Um, and multiple people gave me examples of what they were calling anti-Semitism. And I agreed with them that the examples were anti-Semitism. Um, and I said, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is no good. I, I, I knew we, I was going to have to act because my job Part of it was to lead a campus-wide transformation around equity, social justice, and multicultural education. And not only that, but to promote inclusion on the campus. And to me, Chris, when I hear inclusion, that I'm an educator. I want every single person in the community to feel that they can be their most authentic self and that they're welcomed, appreciated. Speak and freely, yeah. Yes, and, and that we have a viewpoint diversity where we encounter, you know, some ideas that may be different from our own. And that's what college is all about. You know, that's where you grow. Um, and so as I started to hear from people, I was also seated on what was called the Equity Action Council. And this was a, a farcical um, group as well. Um, they didn't focus on fairness from my perspective. They did very little action on the campus, but yet they're getting taxpayer funded dollars, you know, um, to, to engage in these activities. And our local um, Hillel representative came to the Equity Action Council. This is early on, right after all these needs assessment conversations where I had already heard multiple examples of the deeply entrenched anti-Semitism. And they said, this uh, campus is not safe for, for Jewish students. And they said, and we want to help make it right. We have some recommendations for you all. You know, would you please take a look at them? Um, would you please, you know, you have this site where it says uh, standing against uh, racism. Would you please just put a little thing, you have a Black Lives Matter thing there, you have a, a stop AAPI hate thing there. Just put a little thing that says, you know, we stand against anti-Semitism so our do Jewish students can feel a little safer. Um, and, and they asked us simple things like that. And as they were presenting, some of my staff members uh, were dropping into the chat uh, links to uh, the uh, Jewish Voices for Peace and Students for Justice for Palestine and all of these other organizations which are known to be anti-Israel, they're known to be, you know, uh, anti-Jewish. <laughs> um, and after that happened, we went back to our team meeting and, and I said, you know, hey, I was very offended that we had guests speaking to us at Equity Action Council. And you all felt fit to put these links that were antithetical to what they were saying. And their affect was flat. They made no apologies for it. They said, you were putting resources so we can put resources too. Wow. And I said, but these were guests and they were talking to us about important things. And I said, so what about the recommendations they gave us? And my supervising dean said, well, you know, we've got recommendations from CARE, uh, which is the Council on Islamic Relations. And um, we didn't ever do any of those either. So we're not going to do anything about them. And I said, we're not going to do anything. How, how could we just <laughs> ignore the pain that, sh that this woman shared, you know, when she came here and that she told us about how the students are hurting, um, how they were hurt by the uh, student government who, um, when they took a resolution, they wanted the student government to um, adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. And instead, they were shouted down by their own peers. Hmm. And they were shouted down with chants of, from the rivers to the sea, Palestine will be free. I asked her, do you know what that means? And she said, no, you tell me. I said, that means the obliteration of Israel. I said, that's not okay. That's not okay to have an environment where your peers are saying that to you as a student. Would you feel welcome? May I and ask you, well, I'm sorry to interrupt on this story, but this is a great uh, part to interject and ask, do these people 
no, truly understand it? Or, or, or is it just something they're parroting because they think it sounds good? Do they mean these things? I mean, should we understand that so many of these people, these councils, these committees, and the things they say, is it feel good stuff? Is it is it a grift uh, of some kind? Is oh, it, no, is it yeah, uh, sincerely no, no, held beliefs? Oh, yes. These are real beliefs, and they mean what they say. Mm -hmm. They mean what they say. Um, because not only did, did – did the, you know, supervising dean end up saying, you know, uh, you weren't there, um, you know, that 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 didn't happen that way. Um, and, you know, uh, all of these kind of things. But they refused to update their website to just put a, a, sta a simple statement saying, you know, we stand against anti-Semitism, not not defining it, not getting into IRA and all of that. And there's debates. Right. Sure. I understand that. Um, but not even that. And I, and I said, I said, this is a performative act. I said, we don't even have to do anything. All you have to do is just put a statement on the website. You don't have to do anything else. Why would you not do that? And they said, because Jews are white oppressors and we're decentering whiteness here. Oh boy. And I, that's when I knew I was, I was like, what? How, how could you say that? I said, you, you're, you are not understanding the history. You, there's an ignorance here around, you know, the Jewish diaspora and the diversity of it. And so, you know, I knew that not only did the campus need education, but my own staff and my own supervising dean uh, needed education and accurate information. Um, they had been fully steeped in an ideology that was toxic towards Jewish people. And so our, our district uh, board of trustees around this same time, uh, they made a resolution saying that um, it was a very flat one. They didn't define anti-Semitism. They just said, we as a district stand against it. It was empty. Um, but I took that and I said, you know, that's our cue. That's our board of trustees. They direct us, even above me and you and the dean and everyone, right? So I'm going to go ahead and engage this community in some Jewish inclusion and anti-Semitism education. And my dean did not support me in that. My staff did not support me in that. And I, I, I was a director, a quote unquote director, but I had no access to my budget, never saw my budget for the whole two years I was there. I don't know how that equity money was being spent, taxpayer dollars, public funds should be open to everybody. Um, and, and it's not just that place, um, Chris. This is happening on so many other campuses. You I'm know, sure. when I was terminated, I heard from people across the nation um, who were telling me, this is happening at my campus. This goes on here. You know, our DEI department is toxic. They're anti-Semitic. You know, they don't make any statements. And, and the recent events have even shown their faces more, the silence mm. uh, from these universities and colleges. Yeah. Dr. All Lee, of I... them who release these statements supporting Ukraine and this and that, they've been silent at the terrorism that's happened against Israel. And that, to me, that is showing us who they are and what they stand for. And it's time for all of us to say, you know, if that doesn't represent you and your values, pull the funding from your schools, uh, pull the funding if you're a philanthropist giving to a school and your, your alma mater, check out what they're doing. And if it doesn't align with your values, remove that funding. It shouldn't be there. And these programs shouldn't be there either if what they're doing is promoting hate and exclusion. Dr. Lee, when I hear you say a dean said, Jew, you know, Israel, uh, white oppressors, um, as a white guy, uh, I'm, I'm not Jewish, but I am white. That makes me uh -huh. wonder, I have to ask the question, is the, I had, I had kind of um, theorized this, is it all one and the same to people like these, that if you are white, be you Jewish or Christian or uh, agnostic, if you are white, you're inherently just an oppressive person just because you exist as white? Is that a broader context or no? Yes. Well, not only that, let me tell you about this one, um, Chris. Early on, this was two weeks into my two-year adventure here at, at, at that place, um, I had a Google Doc. Uh, that I was using with, you know, my, my staff because I was supposed to lead a strategic, you know, uh, transformation and you have to plan and, you know, um, and, and take notes and so forth. And I, I was showing it to the team and I was saying, you know, hey, I'm new here, you know, maybe, you know, we can collaborate together. I've said it so we can all edit, you know, we can uh, put in events and put in ideas together. And one of my staff members stopped me and they said, stop what you're doing right now. And I was like, whoa. And they were angry. And they said, what you're doing is you're white speaking and you're white splaining <laughs> and you're supporting white supremacy. Oh, and my. I was like, what? <laughs> In my whole life as a black woman, I have never <laughs> been.
been called a white supremacist <laughs> or told that I was supporting white supremacy. And the, and these people were serious. And I and I said to them, I said, you know, hey, I just got here. I haven't come in here name calling or saying any words to you that are offensive. I said, where I come from, I was raised in the Central Valley of California, a small town called Lodi. I said, I knew and encountered growing up actual white supremacists, KKK members, white national socialists. I said, for you to call me a white supremacist is deeply offensive. Wow. I said, please don't call me, you know, any names again. You know, so let's just be professional together. And it was as though I had offended that person and everyone began to behave as though I was the offensive one for saying that. Doctor, and that was early. <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you, I I can't thank you enough for educating me. Anyway, I'll speak for myself. I, I would imagine many in this audience, um, this is kind of the first peek behind the curtain of what this actually means. These terms are thrown around a lot, and I think a lot of people feel intimidated by them because they come from higher education and academia, and people think, well, uh, maybe they're smarter than me, or maybe they know something I don't, and they kind of defer or demure. Uh, and I, I'm so grateful that you're telling these stories so that we can learn what you've actually seen and, and what you've experienced. Um, I, I, I hope there will be more conversations like this. By the way, again, the piece in the New York Post um, dated on the 18th of October was I was a DEI director, DEI drives campus anti-Semitism, also in the Wall Street Journal and a publication called Free Black Thought. Is that right? Yes, sir. Dr. Lee, thank you so much for your time today. It's invaluable. Thank you. Happy to come on again. The Chris DeGall Show Podcast.